I have a feeling that we'll survive. I have a feeling there were so many topics to, to talk about that it's hard to figure out where to start first. Um, maybe we'll just kind of start making a list of uh, <laughs> things to talk about here. Uh, uh, if you actually felt you want to you could attempt if you actually felt you could attempt to prove sure this thing about the neuron severity group or you know struggle oh. towards proving it that would be perfectly great for me okay yeah that was certainly that was certainly one of the things so okay but but again maybe, maybe <laughs> list of things here. okay so the first one is neuron severity the concrete interpretation of for a billion variety. Um, uh, another general topic, which there'd be a lot to set, is this general topic of coxeter and coxeter like tilings in this context, in, in this uh, context of neuron severity uh -huh. lattices of some surfaces, some of the surfaces at least. Uh, um, there's, there's a lot to say about that. Um, you know, even just like for the Gaussian integers, the Eisenstein integers, the Kleinian integers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Let's see. Uh, I claim that there was a whole bunch of topics to talk about. Let's see. Is there a whole bunch of what? Well, uh, let me just mention another one here, which is kind of uh, getting back to the big picture. So maybe maybe we don't want to start with this or anything like that. But uh, you know, what am I trying to say? A lot of this very concrete stuff that we've been doing, trying to understand the beam surfaces has a lot to do with sort of moral preparation for really trying to understand the moduli stack or moduli stacks of abelian surfaces and moduli stacks of abelian varieties more generally and moduli stacks of other things more generally and understanding them in a particular in particular ways i guess particularly from the point of view of having them get interpreted as the spectrum of some two rig. Uh, uh -huh. So um, that's a topic. OK. There's probably a whole bunch of other topics I should be listing here. But I think I'm going to start with the one you suggested here. OK. Well, first of all, there's different versions of this that we could try. So maybe I should get a feeling for what you think we should be doing. So I mean. <laughs> Right. It also it also depends on whether you you know want me to try to prove it or you want me to try to take guesses or something like that. But uh, I know you do want to prove it, right? But um, but do you particularly mean so? The thing that I was really struck by in the last day or two was this idea that it seems that I can understand this idea of uh, well. Understand the idea of the neuron severity group over an, an abelian variety, for example. Um, but perhaps more generally, that I can understand uh, holomorphic line bundles over certain kinds of spaces. Well, for example, over um, abelian varieties um, by this particular method of descent from the universal cover. I don't know if that's actually the right phrase. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if that's the correct phrase that anybody actually uses, but it sort of seemed appropriate you know, uh -huh. in the context. Um, so, you know, I'm basically imagining we have this abelian variety we can temporarily forget that it's a complex manifold. Just think of it as a real torus. We can think about its uh, universal cover. And we can think about you know, the action of the fundamental group on the universal cover. 
well, it's a very straightforward thing. The action of the fundamental group on the universal cover. And then if we just think about lifting that action to the total space of the trivial, well, li li lifting that action, not to an action of the same group, but to an action of this other refinement group, um, which ends up being a sort of Heisenberg-like group, a uh, discrete Heisenberg-like group. I guess it's also sometimes called the Bieberbach group or something like that. But we're kind of lifting the completely straightforward action of the fundamental group on the universal cover of the torus. We're lifting that to an action of this refinement group on the um, uh, on the trivial line bundle over the universal cover. Let's say the trivial Hermitian line bundle over over the, the universal cover. And then it seems like, you know, that's what you do. To, uh, you know, that if you do that in a sensible way, you, you're getting a topological line bundle. But then if you go back and think about that, oh yes, we had a complex structure on this uh, real torus, making it into an abelian variety. Uh, or you could even just say to making it into a complex torus then you can ask if this lifting process, this action lifting process can be done in a way that preserves the holomorphisms. Uh -huh. I don't know, maybe that seems completely obvious now, but. Well, I've been yeah. reading about this stuff. Yeah. Let's yeah. see, yeah. they never, yeah, they do talk about this lifting business. Um, let's see, so the, when you say refine, group what the heck do you exactly mean by that so we start out with okay. this like i can try to this, say but go ahead discrete yeah. we start out with this free abelian group yes free abelian and then group. might as well make it finite right and then and how is that related to the refinement group yes so we have an integer valued group two co-cycle on this uh free abelian group and, um, you know, if you think about what that cohomology group is doing, it's classifying the topological Hermitian line bundles over the space that you're dealing with. In this case, the, you know, in this case, the classifying space or whatever you call it of this free of being group. So, you know, it's in, over a torus. Um, and that two co cycle you're thinking of is valued in, okay, it's valued in Z. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So how does, yes. so how does that fit in with the, uh, what does Z valued two co cycles have to do with line bundles? Let's see, it's supposed to oh, be. Um, Z value two co cycles. I mean, it's, uh, don't tell me, it's like uh, the circle group is K Z, comma, uh, not good at counting here, K zero, comma, one, I guess, K Z, comma, zero, the, the Eilenberg McLean space. Yeah. Uh, did I say that right? Yeah, it's K Z one. Yeah. So, um, you know, so the classifying space for torsors of it, in other words, for Hermitian line bundles, is um, KZ2. So, so this, you know, the second integer cohomology is classifying Hermitian line bundles topologically. So you, this, so this, two co-cycle that you can think of as going from, you think of it algebraically as going from pi one of X times pi one of X to Z, but then you're saying we should think of it more, we can think of it more topologically as going from X to KZ2. Yes, yes. 
Now, when other people are talking about this whole thing, they seem to start off with a more algebraic geometry thing that they call the exponential sheaf sequence. Um, somehow I'm, I'm apparently doing it a slightly different way or something, because I'm really thinking about this topological, maybe just as moral preparation for, for, for this stuff. I'm just thinking about topological line bundles. Uh-huh. And um, yeah, okay, okay, I think I get it. Yeah, that's good in its own right. Um, but then, yeah, one thing I felt like asking people recent, well, yesterday was like, is there such a, th is there a thing like a, a holomorphic refinement of KZ2 such that like maps from a variety into that thing classify holomorphic line bundles? Well, in some context there is, but it's not just gonna be a homotopy. Uh, uh huh. Yeah, no, it's, I didn't expect it to be just a homotopy type, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know exactly what it is, but there must be a whole bunch of things. I mean, I keep on thinking that there's something about Czech cohomology and sheaf cohomology going on here. The, the idea that, I have this vague idea that sheaf cohomology is for classifying bundles of some kind, but with tr transition functions. So you have like some sort of sheaf of transition functions. Just, I'm not sure, I'm sure that makes sense, but. Um, I think I know about that stuff a bit. I think that does make sense. I was just sort of. Looking for something more sophisticated? Yeah, probably, but mainly sort of more like a, classif a classifying object. So like, is there anything at all that's like the universal holomorphic line bundle or the thing with the universal holomorphic. I've never heard people talk about that at all. And so it, it may be like, I, I can imagine Urs Schreiber talking about it or something. It could be like I mean, some other so many sophisticated contexts. thing. There, there's so many different contexts where something like that happens. I mean, maybe it's worth mentioning that, you know, just in the world of two rigs, we have something like that. We have the free two rig on a, line object um once you make up your mind what a two rig is uh -huh. in a good way you know you can say the free absolute two rig on a line object or you could say the free uh total two rig on a line object and and you know so that's like a you know that's like a walking line object or dually it's you know it's it's spectrum dually is like the classifying spectrum in the world of spectrums of two rigs uh -huh. for line, line objects. And we, can, and we can describe that very explicitly. Uh, it's like uh, in the world of absolute two rigs, it would be, don't tell me, it would be the uh, Z graded vector spaces with the usual Tensor product, no, no funny minus sign in the braiding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and the, the the free module on one generator in grade one that is the, the line object. I always get it confused whether it's better to use the convention that it's free in grade one or free in grade minus one, but. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking of something that like wore its holomorphicity on its sleeve a bit more like, so like we have this, for any variety, it has this Picard scheme of all the holomorphic line bundles on it. And I was just wondering if you could, we're getting, we're very, we're talking about almost the same. Well, right. Okay. So uh, you're, you're going back in, in a direction that, yeah, where it's more explicitly involving polymorphic structure. Um, anyway. Um, right, in a way, it looks like you're asking for something more from analytic geometry than from algebraic geometry. So, I mean, there are all sorts of possibilities, but 
I mean, I keep on thinking about things that I don't know about, but I hear people talk bad about, you know, what am I trying to say? Starting with an arbitrary, nice category of spaces, like, you know, algebraic varieties or analytic varieties or something, and then somehow automatically obtaining a sort of homotopy version of that or something like that. I don't know, maybe, uh -huh. maybe line bundles, of homomorphic line bundles would live in a context like that. I don't know. But again, one of the. Okay, that was a digression. Yeah, I mean, that walking line object, it doesn't wear holomorphicity on its sleeve, but nevertheless, it somehow, it doesn't really have to, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, you know, it, it happens automatically when you map it into a context where, you know, when you, when you map it into the category of complex vector spaces. It automatically picks out a, a uh, well, I mean, okay. I mean, it, it automatically picks out an algebraic line bundle, but you know, there's. You said map it into the category of vector spaces, but you meant like map it into the category of vector bundles? Yeah, let's Over. say, uh -huh. yeah. I'm being really sloppy here, but it, yeah, it, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, Okay, that's 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 actually better than I thought. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I mean, so there were all sorts of God versus God issues to deal with there. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, just there, are, I, you know, I don't really understand all of these details, but there's a lot of context where things that are algebraic automatically become analytic and or holomorphic, um, relatively automatically. Uh, but yeah. Okay. Okay. So anyway, yeah. So that was a bit of a digression, but here, I guess I got into it because here, you were, you were um, talking about a way to think about building line bundles on tori, and that was top lot. That was topological. So far, um, yes. yes. And all well. Let's see. And already there was, already there was this like thing that, like one you can go this route where you say like, okay, we're going to reinterpret this Tuco cycle as a map from our torus to KZ two, but that's sort of going off in a direction that's sort of different than how these neuron severi Riemann form kind of guys go, and so yeah. So for some reason, like for them, the way the, they want to like get their hands on the actual line bundle very computationally. And so what they do is they take this two co cycle and then for some reason they they extend it to the vector space that the pi that the pi one group is sitting in, like you said, maybe like tensor that pi one with with R, I guess, and then you think of it. So, so anyway, I'm, uh, I'm sort of wondering what that business is all about. Are you describing the way they figured in, in that book, for example? Or you just thinking? yeah, and also in your email, like you. Well, okay, but let, so, so so let me try to go through it again. The way I, yep. the way I think I remember it. So, all right. But yeah, so we just, we just have to have names for things here. So we have a free being group. Maybe I called it X for some strange reason. You prefer a different name, free being group X mm -hmm. of rank D, I guess. And um, so then we've got this. Uh, this anti-symmetric bilinear uh, integer valued function on it. Mm -hmm. And we think of that in a bunch of ways. And when I say bilinear, I just mean with respect to the integers. Mm -hmm. In this case. 
And that's a, one of the things we do is we interpret that as a two cosine. And I'm being sloppy here, but for some reason that's a real good representative of the of its cohomology class. I mean, it seems like it seems like each of these group cohomology classes, second group cohomology classes, have a unique representative of precisely that form. That might even be true for the, all the cohomology groups. That you know, you just take alternating or anti-symmetric maps or something like that. And maybe you get nice representatives for all the cohomology classes because it looks like it. It looks like it works when you. It, yeah, I think it. I think it does. This book I was. This big book I'm looking at actually seems to say that. Yeah. Uh huh. But I'm sort of going ahead and not worrying about that. I'm just kept taking it for granted that these are the co-cycles that I want to check for whether they are capable of supporting a whole polymorphic structure. So mm -hmm. I, I, you know, given one of these two co-cycles, I get a really nice model, right? I, it, we're, we're doing a lot of like gauge fixing or something here. We're picking really nice representatives for everything. We picked these really nice representatives for the cohomology classes. And then once we have those two co-cycles, we pick really nice representatives for the, the, the topological Hermitian line bundles that they correspond to. And um, so, um, ah, but I guess we play, right, we play some tricks with the alternative interpretation of group cohomology as being group extensions. So again, when you, you know, when you think about what's going on here, this group extension, it's actually the fundamental group of the total space of this permission line bundle. Um, I hope I said that right. I think that's right. Um, Sorry, what's this? You're defining a group extension of who by? Of, let me call it refinement. I hate that word extension, right? Because somewhere along the way, somebody, did they ever straighten that out? Which one is the extender and which one is the extendee? They straightened it out, but in the way that you don't like. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, a refinement of one group, I guess by another or something like that. Uh -huh. um, so right, the group that's being refined is the coarse group and the refinement is the fine group. So the fine is mapping down to the coarse. Mm -hmm. And there's a kernel, which is the refiner or something like that. I don't know. Um, yeah, it's the refiner. So. Um, but here we'd be yeah. refined. Yeah, okay, so. And it's going to be, and, and, and for this particular kind of group cohomology, we're talking about central extensions. And that's, I think that's the only restriction really on this. So we're taking, am I saying it right? Central extensions, yeah. Central extensions of this free abelian group. Central, <laughs> I just call them central refinements. I just, uh, my own rule. Come on. Central refinements. <laughs> Talk <laughs> like normal people. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, sometimes I'll say central extension of um, of well, this free abelian group yep. by this uh, by the integers. So it's very Heisenberg input, and you know it'll be no potent. I mean, I mean, I, I you know informally I call this a a Heisenberg group, a discrete Heisenberg group that we're using, right? Because it, because it, well. Yeah, I was confused for a while because you called it a Heisenberg group, but I guess it's like some skeleton of a, <laughs> Heisen, a scaffolding of the usual Heisenberg group. Yeah, I mean, it's a, um, I mean, again, there's all this hodge theoretic interplay between the discrete and the continuous. So you can actually interpret this as giving you a continuous hodge, a continuous Heisenberg Lie group. Um, but inside of there, we actually have this discrete uh, Heisenberg Lie group. And, th and that, and really what's going on is that, you know, what am I trying to say? That The, the homogeneous space of the Heisenberg Lie group 
um, with respect to the uh, discrete subgroup, uh, discrete co-compact subgroup, the discrete Heisenberg group, that is that homogeneous space is, I hope I'm saying this right, that's the total space of the Hermitian line bundle. Okay. Yeah, I was having trouble getting this stuff. So you've got this discrete Heisenberg group sitting inside this Heisenberg Lee group. I'll just use those words for him. And then you're saying that the quotient the quotient is the total space of the line bundle that we're after. Right, now there might be, you know. That makes sense. There's some annoying minor details in how you I should say the out. total space of the circle bundle we're after, yeah. It's. Oh, uh, right, uh, yeah. the circle bundle, right. The oriented circle bundle, right. Uh, the principal circle bundle, right, 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 right. And then you can think of the Heisenberg, you said, sorry, then you can think of the he, Hermitian line bundle. Boy, I'm having trouble with all these H's. <laughs> Hermitian <laughs> Hodge. Three H? Yeah. H3. Um, but the, or the Hermitian, right, the Hermitian line bundle is just an associated vector bundle uh, from the principal fiber bundle with respect to the hopefully obvious representation. I guess it's the totalizing organization of U1. Mm -hmm. So the the discrete the discrete group is that's gotten by taking this anti-symmetric bilinear thing and using it as a you know a so-called carry digit function. Mm -hmm. Carrying, yeah, so I always have something, what's the units digit, what's the tens digit, but yeah. The, in this case, the tens digit is the center, right? Things get carried into the center, but they don't come back from the center. The center is a bit of a black hole. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so that's how it goes. Yep. Um, okay, now I actually get it and somehow, right. somehow so, so far these annoying formulas for automorphy factors or whatever has been like swept under the rug in a pleasant way. Well, so again, they're being swept under the rug in a, in a pleasant way? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Well, but well, but, but yeah, we're I mean, about I, to. I was very annoyed by the automorphic factors, but when I realized that they're just giving you an action by the refinement group, then I became much happier with that. So we've got an actual action by the refinement group that's lifting the action of the original group, the unrefined group, the coarse group, on the base space. And it's very explicit. And it is given explicitly by the automorphic factors. But we, 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 could, we could, yeah. So we actually try to write down an explicit formula for the action. Uh, of the, of what, on what? <laughs> Sorry, of the discrete Heisenberg group on the continuous Heisenberg? Of the discrete no. Heisenberg group on the trivial Hermitian line bundle over the universal cover. Uh -huh. So we have, you know, like this element X1 in X. And we just want to say how that acts. 
that's pretty much what we have to say. I mean, right, the center will act in some very straightforward way. What if the center just acts vertically in some sensible way? Yeah. Um, but the, uh, the element x1, uh, originally in x, but now it's thought of as an element in this refinement group, it acts in some very straightforward, sensible way that just really uses the anti-symmetric bilinear form. It, it, you know, it should be, it should be right? I, 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 maybe I didn't write this down, but it, it should really come very easily. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to say, um, we have uh, a, an, an, an element, let's call it Y, unless you got something better. Uh, or let me call it P, P for point. It's, it's a point in this universal cover. Maybe I should even call it V for vector because that universal cover is a vector space. So I'm, I'm going to call that V. Okay. And, um, but now a point in the total space of the trivial line bundle is V comma Z, right? Z is a complex number. Yeah, so right, so, right. So we're doing in the Hermitian line bundle picture rather than in the circle bundle picture, rather than in the principle. Okay. So um, we're trying to get, uh, you know, X1 to act on this ordered pair that's a point in the total space. And that ordered pair that's a point in the total space is V comma Z. And it should be something really obvious. So yeah, so V should get replaced by just V plus V gets replaced by gets replaced by V plus X one, and that parses. Uh huh. Yep, that's the translation. Right. Part. Uh -huh. That's right. So that's the unrefined part, and then you just have to come up with the sensible guess for the refined part, and so that says that. Still coming. Uh, that. Uh, so the new thing is going to be a lot like the original one. What was the original one? The original one was Z, Z. but with a factor. Is that right? Yeah. So Z times the exponential of 2 pi i times mm -hmm. this thing, this anti-symmetric bilinear thing evaluated at the two things that we have, right? Doesn't that seem right? I hope I guessed correctly. Which are X1 and V? X1 and V. That's right, that's right, that's right. So, you know, you kind of added X1 and V when you were figuring out the base coordinate, uh, whereas you multiplied them. Well, did you multiply them? No, you paired them in a multiplicative way, you paired them in a bilinear way. In, yeah, right. So you have a bilinear pairing, anti-symmetric bilinear pairing. Um, that's what you do to get the factor by which. Okay. I was trying to think of the right word. So I was going to say the factor by which Z gets dragged, but dragged isn't quite the right word there. It's more like it's being okay. dragged kicking and screaming or something like that. Um, it's being yeah, perturbed or something as, uh, yeah, so I think that, I think that's, I think that's it. Why did we not need the, uh, let's see, never mind, uh, it's okay. You know, so when, then I've been working, the... when I've been working this out, I've certainly come across plenty of places where, you know, I got really annoyed by annoying technical details. 
I'm hoping we've managed to sweep most of those annoying technical details on the road. Like, I, you know, I used to get really annoyed by the factor of one half in the Campbell Baker Hausdorff formula, because we really are dealing with this discrete Heisenberg group inside of this uh, continuous Heisenberg group. But, you know, that continuous Heisenberg group, it's really closely related to the Lie algebra, and it's a nilpotent Lie algebra, which makes the Campbell Baker Hausdorff formula especially nice and simple, but not so nice and simple that it can get rid of that factor of one half that drives me up the wall. So um, I'm hoping I didn't commit some horrible sin by neglecting a factor of one half in the Campbell Baker Hausdorff formula. I think it really, I think you really don't, if you, you know, if you think about it in the morally correct way, you don't even have to think about that. Campbell Baker Hausdorff formula. So one thing is yeah. that this two pi i business means that when there's no there's another factor right there, even a factor of two pi i, I'm I'm capable of getting driven up the wall by that. Well, but that. anyway, what it does, what it's there for, and I hope it should, I hope it's, hope this is a good thing, is that when x one and v are actually both in your lattice, then this isn't. This is equal to one. This is equal to two. So, so hopefully that's like something that you want. That and what does that mean? It means that when you're you're having this action of this <laughs> okay, sorry, you're assuming X1 is in this lattice already <clears throat> all along. Uh, but so, yes. yeah, so then the only, so, the, so what I could say is like when V is also actually in the lattice, then this is, this E to the two pi I thing is equal to one. And so, so why do we want that? I mean, it must be that that's what we want. <laughs> Um, I mean, it certainly made sense when I was thinking about it. Um, so what's the nature of the question? Say it again, let's see. Why, it is, why does that make sense? Uh, I mean, if you didn't want, if you didn't want this factor, e to the two pi i alpha, I'm calling the bilinear thing alpha. Alpha of x one v. If you didn't want that to be one, when v was in the lattice, then you wouldn't need that two pi i. And alpha wouldn't need to be integer valued; it could be like real valued. But we're trying to make it be to like something works perfectly. I mean, in some sense, what am I saying this right? What am I trying to? Do? Okay, wait a minute. Let me think. Uh, I mean, it's stupid. It's just we're just trying to understand how this, how do two co-cycles work? How do they encode? So, okay, you're asking for intuition about how this carry digit function gives you instructions on how to build a line bundle. Well, I mean, there really are pictures, <laughs> right? These are the pictures that I tried to show you. Uh, Uh, <laughs> you don't like the picture. <laughs> I, you don't have enough video game experience. I mean, you know, it's like you know, you're you you're in a little cubicle and you walk out one side of the cubicle and you come out shifted on the other side of the cubicle. <laughs> um, that's what's happening here. Uh, yeah, but I want you to say something like, "It needs yeah. this thing needs to be one, so that we can." I don't, I'll just make up some random junk so that we can mod out by something and get a bundle that's actually over the Yeah, torus yeah. Or something I mean, it's like. obviously a consistency condition of some kind. Um, what, what are we trying to say? Um, ah, what are we trying to say? 
So, I mean, so far you've managed to get a, an action of a lattice on the trivial line bundle over the vector space. I'll call it, when I say the vector space, I mean the lattice tensor, the real numbers. Well, uh, then, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling here, but one of the things that I, one of the things that we haven't said out loud yet, and maybe I should have said it at some point, is that, what am I trying to say here? Uh, I mean, we've been talking about the, I mean, there's a universal cover of the base torus. There's the universal cover of the total space of the of the bundle that we're trying to construct but there's also the universal couple of, of the fiber and that's somehow important here and that's sort of that, right that's the whole story that's that the e to the two pi is automatically taken care of um right so in this in this Heisenberg Lee algebra, Heisenberg Lee group, continuous Heisenberg Lee group, yeah. Um, you know, it's 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 really just like a like a um uh I mean it's shaped like a vector space. It's it doesn't it's not it's it's contractible and stuff like that. Uh and what am I trying to say? That uh <coughs> It uh... let's see. Okay, right. So, okay. What if you take this Heisenberg Lee group? And you wrap it up just with respect to the part of the discrete subgroup that's in the center. So that's just a copy of Z in the center. And that's these e to the two pi's or something like that. I mean, right? I mean, the exponential wrapping map is automatically taking care of that for us. It's kind of saying that we're. Right, we're dealing with it. We're dealing with a trivial, right? We had a trivial, you know. We, for, I mean, really, right? The you have a trivial bundle over the universal cover of the torus, whose fibers are just the universal cover of the circle. Mm -hmm. But the you know the periodicity of the exponential map is automatically converting that for us into this trivial bundle where the fiber is a, a circle or, you know, or, or a punctured complex plane or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And right, so, so it's, I mean, we're, we're just, right? In order to construct this line bundle, we really need to think about how the fibers are themselves circles. The fibers are themselves wrapped up. Mm -hmm. so, so I think the answer to your question must have something to do with that. <laughs> I'm not saying what it has to do with it, but it, it must. I mean, the, if you just if you just think about that, it must tell you the answer. Um, okay. Well, I guess I'll try to think about it sometime. Well, not now. <laughs> all right. So, okay, I didn't give a good answer to that, but but yeah, maybe I'll go home and think about that too. Actually, actually let me see if I can write down what the question is because it sounds like we're not really satisfied with any answer that we've given yet. So what's the question? The question is, 
<laughs> can you state, can you? Well, like a really short yeah. way to state the question is like, why do you need that two pi i in there? Like what, what would go wrong if, it, if, it, if it was just like i, I instead of two yeah, pi? Yeah, I, I really feel like I was, like I, I feel I really, really feel like I have been addressing that question, but maybe not in a very good way yet. But let me, let me write down the question in that way. Why the two pi i? The emphasis on the two pi. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm sort of hoping that you can come back and tell me the answer. <laughs> but I probably I'll, can. I'll, I'll I... also try and go home and think about. Uh -huh. Yeah. A good way to say it, or, or maybe it'll even become clear as we continue talking about. It. So let's keep on talking about this a little bit. Okay. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I find my, I find that I do sometimes get myself a little bit confused between thinking about these two different trivial bundles, one where the fiber is itself contractible and just, you know, the universal cover of the circle um, huh. versus this other one where it is itself. You mean this complex line bundle that you get in the end? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yes. Well, I mean, there's, there's the number of species. So there's the, there's the principal circle bundle versus the associated Hermitian line bundle. That's one distinction. But then there's also with this principal circle bundle, there's this, right? I guess there's this other weird associated bundle where you replace, does that make sense? Can you replace the fiber by its universal cover? Um, I don't think you can usually do that, <laughs> but you can go back. Right. We're going the other. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. So we've, like I think we've joked about this other idea of a line bundle, which is like a where the structure group is just R. Exactly. It's exactly. like the kind of line bundle no one, one normally wants to talk That's about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a more sensible line bundle than one of these things with circles. <laughs> line bundle. Uh, so we're like taking a line bundle and turning it into a circle bundle and then turning it back into a complex line bundle. Yep. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. And, 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 I, and, I, and I'm very often very sloppy about. Which stage of that I'm at, and some of those differences make practically no difference at all. You know, just like going from the circle to the mission vector space, mission whatever, mission line. Uh -huh. But going from the, you know, straight line to the circle, that's you know, making a big difference, but it's this big difference that is swept under the rug by the periodicity of the exponential function. You know, so there's something very swept under the rug but that's being handled in an allegedly very elegant way just by, so uh, again, sometimes I talk about these automorphy terms, you know, that you have before uh, you get to the automorphy factor. I, I guess when you, if you work with the automorphic terms, you have to sort of explicitly mod out by this discrete center to get the circle. You know, you say the real, the additive group of the real line modulo the number one, or the number two pi i, or something like that. No, <laughs> let's say the number one, two pi mm -hmm. i is not a, a real number. Okay. So. Um, okay. So anyway. Let's blunder on maybe and think about like okay. this holomorphicity. Yes, yes, yes. Property. Well, yeah. So right. We allegedly did write down this very explicit uh automorphy factor system, but thought of instead of thinking of this horrible automorphy factor way that gets me confused, I just think of it as an action. Uh an action on this 
total space of this trivial Hermitian line bundle. And, um, and again, it's not an action of the original group, it's an action of the refined group. But you can check, right, that's a good exercise, right? Checking that this really is an action of this refinement group. And if it doesn't work, then let me check the picture a little bit. So, but I think the way we said it, it actually works. You find that it's a, it's a homomorphism of the group with that carry digit function, and it's exactly designed to be. Maybe that's another answer to your question, right? I mean, to, right? We we've, we've said what this discrete group is as by the carry digit multiplication, and um, when we're giving this action, we're trying to make sure that it really is a homomorphism from that refinement group rather than from some other refinement. And in order to get that to work out, you know, you have to understand how the period just to give the exponential function works and stuff like that. Does that help? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. I have a feeling, I have a feeling that's true. I have a feeling that when you're checking the homomorphism law, you know, for X1 and X2, Well, not just for X1, really for X1 comma some central thing and X2 comma some central thing, you know, and then you check that it works out. That the homo homomorphism law works with, uh, you know, the carrying Heisenberg multiplication of these two elements. You'll find that there's a point where you use the periodicity of the exponential function to get the two sides of the equation to agree so that the homomorphism law, I didn't actually check this, but it seems very plausible. Okay, well, yeah, I can try to check that. Yeah, I don't know if I will, but I can. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, um, well, okay, right. That's something I can go home and check and see if what I just said is actually true, but I, but I think it's probably true that, you know, there really is a place when you're proving this, that you have a homomorphism from the correct refinement group. I think there's a place where, you know, you use the periodicity of the exponential function to prove that the two sides of the equation for the homomorphism property are the same. So, yeah, so, so we've given, right, we've given, a, we've given an explicit way to interpret one of these very nice two co-cycles, one of these very nice carry digit functions. We've given an explicit way to interpret it as very, very explicit instructions for how to construct this plain old Hermitian line bundle. No, whole, no holomorphic properties, no holomorphicness property yet. Um, but it, you know, it, it, when you do it right, we, we get this very explicit Hermitian line bundle, generally non-trivial Hermitian line bundle over our torus. And, um, mm -hmm. And then, and then the only thing preventing that from giving us a holomorphic line bundle, as far as I can tell, is if these action maps that we're modding out by, that we're taking the you know orbit space with respect to, if, if those were non-holomorphic with respect to you know whatever our preferred you know, we, we could have picked any old complex structure on this vector space that we have, that's the universal cover of the torus. Just pick uh -huh. any old complex structure on that. And um, mm -hmm. and you use the, you know, the, the the trivial holomorphic, I mean, right? The, I mean, the trivial line bundle gets a whole holomorphic structure too. 
So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So um, we've actually got a particular holomorphic structure on the total space of this Hermitian line bundle. So it, it is in fact a holomorphic line bundle. So, you, you know, it has now no problem at all. The, the, the thing on the universal cover is a holomorphic Hermitian line bundle from my understanding of the definitions of a holomorphic Hermitian line bundle. And the only thing that could prevent the descent bundle the thing that we're getting, the only thing that could prevent that descent bundle from being holomorphic is if these things that we're modding out by are themselves non-holomorphic. Mm -hmm. So I think we want to check, right, that's what I think. We want to check that those maps are holomorphic. And that's on my list of things to do, to you know, really take these formulas that we were writing down about the, uh, the action of the refinement group. And really check and see that those are check and see whether those are holomorphic maps. And here's my vague idea. I'm, uh, here's our, here's my hope about how that's going to work out. My hope about how that's going to work out is that you know there's going to be a certain very nice algebraic condition that we're going to prove is equivalent to these lifted action maps being holomorphic. And um, and, and, and the reason it's gonna work out that nicely, I hope, is because the holomorphicness of these lifted action maps is going to follow from the fact that in a certain sense, they can be extrapolated to a, a continuous action, not just a discrete action, right? I mean, so, right, this is a very discrete group that we're modding out by, mm -hmm. but, if you do it right, it, it sort of extends in a certain way to a continuous action. You could just interpolate between these discrete elements. And then I think it becomes very easy to just check whether that interpolated continuous action, whether that is holomorphic. Uh, is that true? I, this was my strategy. I didn't really check whether this works, mm -hmm. but I, th I think it might help. Maybe it, you don't. Holomorphic in the acted on variable. Good question. <laughs> uh, I think that's what it should I, be. I think that's all we have to worry about. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes me I, not so clear why extrapolating the actor variable helps I, us. I, I agree. I didn't realize I sounded that stupid until I said it out loud. But um, <laughs> I still have a vague feeling that it might be easier. To to prove that the interpolated thing, <laughs> no, maybe you're right. Maybe that doesn't help at all. Um, it feels like the, it feels like just from what I know that the holomorphicity condition should be something that requires that you stare at this e to the two pi alpha x one of v thing and see if it looks holomorphic in the acted on variable. Well, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm, I think I sort of understand what you're saying, but I mean, the way I'm thinking of it is that, you know, this complex structure is, you know, an operator, an operator whose eigenspaces are I and negative I or something like that, I guess after you complexify or something like that. Before you complexify, it has no eigenvectors. Mm -hmm. So it's just that, it's just that, you know, that operator of multiplication by i, that's the way we're encoding a complex structure, multiplication by i. And so, right, the nice elegant way that that ends up being you know, the nice elegant way to state the compatibility condition to, between that and this anti-symmetric bilinear map is just to say, well, first of all, you know, this anti-symmetric bi bilinear map, it was originally integer valued, but now we're just, you know, extending it to a real 
bilinear thing, anti-symmetric real bilinear thing. Mm -hmm. And you could just ask for that. Yeah, I think it parses if you just ask for that anti-symmetric bilinear thing to itself be invariant under, you know, the rotation uh, under under the one par parameter group generated by this operator, this formal multiplication by i operator. Right. I mean, it, right. As soon as you can, as soon as you put this multiplication by i in there, you can multiply by any, any complex number, including all the numbers on, on the unit circle, and that, that's this one parameter. I hope I said that right. One parameter group generated by i. And you just want the symplectic structure to be invariant under that. And I think that's you know, I think that's what's called a Hermitian form. Uh, or, you know, I've been calling it a pseudo Hermitian form, but maybe you've been telling me that a lot of people just call it a Hermitian form. Uh, yep. Um, let's see. Uh, so, how is that thing? Yeah. So, that's not the same as this. Right, so that, okay, that has this, or we started out with this real bilinear form, which I'm just calling alpha for some reason. And uh, okay, and now you're gonna make it be, I just from memory, it's, it winds up being like the, well, it's sort of obviously gonna be the imaginary part because it's anti-symmetric of something. And we want that something to be, well, <laughs> we want it to be the imaginary part of some permission form in this general sense of permission. Yeah, so in some way, you know, use, am I saying this right? You use the complex structure to, I was gonna say raise and lower indexes, but maybe it sort of evens out or something like that. That, you know, since the complex thing is itself, I mean, complex things, am I saying this right? What do I mean? Uh, I mean, right, there's just this way for the three structures to fit together. Uh, you know, in the, it's just a, a unitary structure, is a unitary vector space, is a, unitary structure is really a complex structure and a symplectic structure, linear symplectic structure and a Euclidean structure. And they just fit together in this way, and, and one of the ways to fit to, to describe the way they fit together is what we just said, that the complex structure, the one parameter group determined by the complex structure preserves the symplectic structure. You could also say equivalently that I hope that, well, am I saying this right? See here, I'm falling into this trap, right? There's this question of, I, I, right, part of the time I, get into trouble because I forget whether I'm talking about unitary structures or these degenerate unitary structures, you know, without the positive definiteness condition. Um, so, so, but, but I think it probably is true that, let, let's see, it, it, you know, the, even if we don't have the positive definiteness condition, then the condition that The condition that the one parameter group from the complex structure preserves the symplectic structure, that's equivalent to, to it preserving the Euclidean structure, I think. The same one parameter group preserving, you know, and you and you get the symplectic structure and the Euclidean structure from each other by. I mean, I just sort of think think of it as some sort of index game, but Maybe there's some more elegant way to say it. Um, yeah. More, maybe there's a more conceptual way to say it. Yep. So, so do you see what I'm saying, right? I mean, that. so on the one side we have this 
strikingly simple compatibility condition, which, um, I mean, again, I, I tend to think of it, does this make sense to say that it's like a from a Kleinian geometry point of view? It's just that we're saying that, what am I trying to say? We have, uh, we have the unitary subgroup. I mean, I guess we have, right, we have, we have these, we have the general linear group over the reals in an even number of dimensions. And then we have a couple of subgroups of that. Like perhaps the, you know, the general linear group over the complex numbers in half of those dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a subgroup coming from preserving a complex structure. And then we have this other subgroup that preserves the symplectic structure. Mm -hmm. So it's the symplectic group in an even number of dimensions. And in the standard setup, those, right, you can, you can get a lot of different interests. If you move them around, if you conjugate one of those subgroups, you can move them around so they intersect in funny ways. But um, the standard way for them to intersect is that they intersect in the unitary group. And um, am I saying that right? Again, am I assuming, somehow I keep on saying it so that I'm talking about the case where the symplectic structure is non-degenerate, but we're trying to do something more general than that, right? Um, this this, this anti-symmetric bilinear map doesn't have to be non-degenerate as a symplectic form. And it doesn't have to give you something positive. It doesn't have to give you a unitary structure in the usual sense. Right, 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 right. So, um, but- right. it, just, it just doesn't have to be positive definite, right? It doesn't have to be positive or definite. So. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not positive. <laughs> uh, so, um, So that means I'm apparently I, I keep on falling into that stupid trap, but I, I, I think it's easy. I think we can get out of that trap just by saying things the right way instead of saying it in a stupid way. Yeah, maybe that means that in, at this point I shouldn't try to think of it in that Kleinian geometry way. But but we still have we just have this, you know, this is it's just a syntactically very simple thing you can write down that what I'm saying that the I know mean, there's some funny reciprocity thing going on. I don't mean anything deep by reciprocity. I'm just saying that the simple textbook statement of the compatibility condition is that the one parameter group from the complex structure preserves the anti-symmetric bilinear thing. Mm -hmm. But the more conceptual thing is that the from the anti-symmetric bilinear thing, you get this discrete action of the refinement group. And that preserves the complex structure. So, it, you know, from one point of view, from the sort of what I what I think of as the conceptual point of view, um, we're talking about this discrete refinement group preserving the holomorphic structure, so that you can, you know, so that when you mod out by it, you, you're just you know, you're just doing that modding out in the holomorphic category, and you get something holomorphic as a result. Uh -huh. That's the conceptual thing. But we, but I, I'm hoping that that's just equivalent to this reciprocal-ish thing that, that talks about something completely different, seemingly completely different. It talks about preservation of the symmetric bilinear, this anti-symmetric bilinear thing by the one parameter group coming from the complex structure. So that's kind of what uh -huh. I'd like to see. I'd like to see an elegant proof that those two sort of reciprocal properties uh, yeah. are equivalent. Okay, yeah, that's a good project because, yeah, so that sort of um, it might even be a little bit new because it's, it's also vaguely, it's also vaguely reminding me of, you know, when you look at the unitary again, okay, now I'm deliberately falling into the, the, the positive definite case in, in the, in, in the positive definite case, you know, you can think of the whole structure as formed from the one of the alternatives is you could think of it as explicitly starting with symplectic structure and Euclidean structure. 
And then the complex structure is an afterthought somehow from that. Um, but when you do it that way, you've got, am I saying this right? Is it, I have this vague feeling, I could be wrong, that there's some sort of you know, reciprocal-ish thing going on there as well. Like if a symplectic structure somehow acts on the Euclidean structure and vice versa, I don't know. I don't, that's just a vague idea. But yeah, I, that, so yeah, I mean, I mean, so this, this little reciprocity lemma that I'm talking about, that, that's what I think of as the key to what you started asking me about today. So I'm sort of annoyed that I didn't get around to saying that until this far into the discussion. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, I think, is really the heart of the answer to this, is proving that little reciprocity uh -huh. lemma. Do we, do we really think it's true? <laughs> is it possible that that is true? Um, it seems plausible that it's true because on the one hand we know that the rest of the world says this definition of Riemann form that requires that the anti-symmetric bilinear form be preserved by multiplication by i, that's how they put it, and that that's like the magic trick for getting the line bundle to be holomorphic. Yeah. But then on the other hand, there, well, maybe I can Maybe I can blame them for not understanding the proof of it. So maybe they're like, give a sort of nasty proof of that. But then on the other hand, it seems really believable that, <clears throat> that what you want is for your discrete Heisenberg group to act holomorphically on the trivial line bundle yes, over yes. the complex vector that's space and that think. that would be like the reasonable condition to get a that's what i think more. and and, so. and and when i was flailing around with the idea of interpolating or extrapolating or something like that it didn't sound like it made that much sense but i think from this point of view it might make a little bit of sense that it, 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 i think i had the vague feeling that when you're trying to prove, prove this reciprocity lemma you might actually find it useful to sort of interpolate between the things. Uh, but I, I don't know if no, I don't know if that's true. Mm -hmm. I mean I just have this vague mental image that you're trying to check that you know the the, the two waves are in phase or <laughs> something like that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But um, yeah so that's my idea so far. Okay, hey, that's enough on this stuff. I think I sort okay. of get it, sort okay. of get it. <laughs> and okay. Be, okay. I think the, ne the next step, well, if I had the energy, the next step would be just to compute some things. It may be that what I'll actually do is like try to improve the Wikipedia article on Riemann formed, <laughs> just to sure. Sure. say the stuff that I can read in a book. Sure, but uh, it, it almost sounded like you were either going to go to another topic yourself right now or give me an excuse to go to another topic or something like that. Yep, that's what I'm doing. Okay. I don't mind if you I don't mind if you do it. Well, so again, I'm not really sure what we should do, but let's let's think, yeah. <laughs> we're going to try to quit in a half an hour. So let's yeah. try to just fool around with some of this Coxeter tiling fixture and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, maybe, maybe I can get you to do the heavy lifting with the screen sharing. Maybe you can bring up the picture of the, don't tell me. I can do it. Something, something, square something, honeycomb. Don't tell me what's the uh, square tiling honeycomb, square. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean. Let me, I don't want to try to, <laughs> Okay. I don't, okay. don't want to try to remember what it's called. I want to find the picture. Um, you can might, might just be able to just refer to your own email and bring it up or something like that. Yeah, no, I, I've got it here. It's not hard to find a picture. It's just annoying to figure out what it's called. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, so yeah, so I was so I think we're sort of ag agreeing that maybe 
this one should be like the easiest I mean, this one to, the to do. Dual. What? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying that maybe this is like the easiest one to 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 do. Here it is. Is this it? Yeah, this is it. So this is called the four three three honeycomb, or maybe four or, four three. Ah, did I type in the? I gave. I may have given it the. That'd be really annoying. Yep, I even gave the file the wrong name. I keep. I kept saying four four three three when I should have said four four. Three. But mm -hmm. yep, four. Here it is. Anyway, do you see that thing? No, am I screwing up? What am I? Uh, something, something is. It's just being a little bit slow, but maybe something is happening on the screen. But it's reading really slow so far. Uh, um, let me, oh wait a minute. Uh, okay, there's. <laughs> sorry, I'll stick it. Let's see. I think I can do a better version of it now. Here, let's, I mean, what is, I noticed. How about that? that? I noticed that an icon appeared on my screen. Okay, that, that's yeah, good. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Now the Poincaré dual that we probably don't want to think about too much because I think this is actually the correct one in some sense to look at. Yeah, I mean I have the Poincaré dual, dual here too. Octahedral. What? Yeah, I've got that available too, but I won't show you that unless right. you want. Right. So yeah, we, we I think we really want to think about this one. Right. So that one presumably had these ideal octahedra, whereas this has these uh, ideal. <laughs> Infinity gon, infinity gons, which are square tilings going all the way to the. All right, so let me bound. say some stupid things here. Uh -huh. Let me tell you where I think the Gaussian integers sort of are in this picture. Okay. And where I sort of think they are is um, in the centers of those squares. Like, okay, th th so there's a, big, there's a big square in the middle, and in the big square in the middle, there's a lot of little distorted squares. I mean, the big Well, square that's sort of behind it, but yeah, I mean, now that I've done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that's like going off back into the distance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so you want to have a dot right here, but not in the distance, but right, right in the. Something like front. <laughs> something like that. Why is there? Is it really a big empty hole like that, or did they just? They just got drawing? tired of drawing this. They got tired of drawing. Yeah. Because yeah, I'm hoping. I'm my it's, my first hope is that it. I might be wrong, but I think I want it to you know shrink away to to nothing. And yeah, I think it. I way. think it does. I think they just got had trouble going on forever or something. Well, you know, it also depends on what projections they're using because when they do that octahedral one the, when they do the Poincaré dual of this yeah uh right that's one we don't want to think about but I'm I, but I just want to say that part of what seemed hard to interpret about that other the Poincaré dual one was that all the edges in it looked really straight and you know so when I was thinking of like the 2D analog of that right there's this model of the hyperbolic plane where they just have straight lines are the straight um, uh, cores. Yeah, yeah, that's Klein's version. Very possibly. When I, when I looked it up, they called it the Beltrami Klein model or something like that. Okay. I don't yeah. know who Beltrami was. But um, I so think he, yeah, well, anyway, I don't know. I think he should be using the Poincare one, but I actually know the guy, so I could ask him. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Say that again, what? I actually know the guy who made these, so I could ask him what he was doing. Yeah, at some point we should. At some point For some reason, should. I don't think he was using the Beltrami Klein one. But anyway. Yeah, it didn't really make sense that he was using it, but it didn't make sense that he wasn't using it either. Um, so, so I, did I say, yeah. Did, so what, what I'm sort of saying is that those little squares and you know the one, the squares that are getting really little towards the center, I think those are like hmm, not sure what the proper terminology is. I think those are like Voronoi cells of Gaussian integers. So, so why Gaussian do you think... integers themselves are right in the middle? So why do you think that? Okay, so now now we have to bring another one up. So which one was this called? This one, if you had properly named it, it would have been. Four. It's now properly named. It's four four three. Yeah. Four four three. Okay. So square tiling is four four. 
And then I guess there's supposed to be three square tilings meeting at each edge. Yes, but for the one we want now, and I've got I, them all did, here. I do know where it is, but I'm hoping you can find it. I've got them all on my desktop. I haven't yet. <laughs> okay, the one I'm hoping for them. is 633. Uh, no, I think you mean 636. I think 633. Threes. I think it's 633. Don't tell me I screwed up this thing too. <laughs> I, I hope just... you did. I'm, I'm hoping <laughs> okay. that's uh, Maybe I did. Let's see. Let me see what it says about 633 honeycomb. 633 honeycomb. Oh, wow. 633 honeycomb. Uh, Oh, wow. Well, okay. Maybe I did screw up in some other way. So I have, I think here's, so. yeah, I don't know. So here, I'll, here is a, anyway, just for starters, here is a 633 honeycomb. It's actually a different picture than I had showed you before. So this looks awfully similar, which is maybe good. Yes, yes, this is great. And in particular, right. I, I mean, I don't really know how this works, but this is, but this is what I think is, happening here. I think this is exactly the same as the previous one, except with the Eisenstein integers in the place of the Gaussian integers. So in other words, I'm claiming that those hexagon, those little hexagons in the middle, those are Voronoi cells of Eisenstein integers. Well, that would be interesting. Um, why don't you tell me why you think that? You tell me why you think that, and then I'm gonna meanwhile look up something to make sure I. Sure, sure. Well, right okay. <laughs> but as usual, I'll tell you why by you know sort of trying to extend the pattern. So, like, think about the Kleinian integers for a moment, which is, you know, something like the square root of negative seven or something like that. But you know, the actual. What is it? It's something like, you know, it's got those half integer things in it. So it's got like the average of one and the square root of negative seven or something. That's like one of the generators of the Kleinian integers. I think, you know, some of these have Kleinian. <laughs> okay, that's your name, right? Uh huh. Well, there's reasons why it's called the Kleinian integer. You know, it's related to the. Does anyone say that except you? I thought they did. I thought they okay. did. Okay, I'll check it out sometime. I never heard that. Okay. Uh -huh. But well, because it's very related to the Kleinian quartet. There's a there's some really yeah. Well, I, uh, yeah, I yeah. I thought yeah. I thought this is just your own personal joke, but no, I don't. No, I don't think it is. I think if you look at the article on the Klein quartet, I think uh -huh. somewhere somewhere I think you'll you'll find people talking about the Klein quartet and the Kleinian integers. And okay. how they're related. They're related. There's really fun stuff to talk about them. But in particular, you know, you can just take the Kleinian integers as a subring of the complex numbers. And you can, you can what? You can take vor, vor, the vor, Voronoi cells of Kleinian integers. So those wouldn't be quite as symmetrical as the regular hexagons for the Eisenstein integers or the regular squares for the Gaussian integers, but they'd be, you know, nice looking. And so I'm sort of asking you to imagine a picture that's a lot like the two that we've been looking at, except um, it's got those Kleinian Voronoi cells instead of the Gaussian or the integer Voronoi cells. So it apparently, you know, it won't be like, I think we both agree that it doesn't look like it's gonna give a Coxeter tiling. It's not going to be so uniform that it's going to give a Coxeter tiling. But I think it's going to be, you know, semi regular, semi uniform. And it's going to correspond to GL2, comma, the Kleinian integers in roughly the same way that this picture we're staring at corresponds to GL2, comma, the Eisenstein integers. And again, we can haggle about whether it's GL or PGL or SL or PSL. 
but you know, we really think that uh, we think that these abelian surfaces, you know, the ones with the ones where you take a quadratic number ring, so you've got an elliptic curve with complex multiplication, and then you just square that elliptic curve, take the Cartesian square of that elliptic curve, and that ends up with you know SL two comma that quadratic number ring. Uh, did I say S? I should have said G. I, I, no, I tend to prefer G over S. But I think the G would act, you know, on the. Uh, it would uh -huh. act on the vector space, and then it would act on the Neron Severi lattice in Minkowski space, and it would act on these projective hyperboloids. I guess the PGL would act on the projective hyperboloids, and maybe the. Uh -huh. Yeah, we might be seeing PGL acting here or PSL or something or something like that. You know, right? There's all. Yeah, I think I, <laughs> I think I know. Right, right. A little and better what, than what, what you. Wrote, you sound you like you're email, flailing right? around deliberately. <laughs> what? Say it again? You sound like you're flailing around deliberately, yes. randomly enjoying how they're like so many groups. Yes. But uh, anyway. Um, so, so let me try to tell you my guess. By the way, you were right. You were right. I should have been talking about six, three, three mm -hmm. all along in the sense that that is like the one that's known to be. <clears throat> so that Coxeter group has PSL Eisensteinians inside. Yeah, I, think you, I think you claimed that it was index two in the rotations or index four in the reflection, with the whole reflection. Yeah, yeah. I, it sounds I hope. I, I, mean, I do, would have preferred it was index six because you know the Eisenstein <laughs> integers, but that's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. But you get the, I hope you get the point that like, so like there's this, like, like there's this big Lorentz group that preserves the Minkowski metric. And that has four connected components. Yes. Which, yeah, OK. I said this in my email, but yeah. And so. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. I mean, a, a, yes, a lot of what you said was yeah. very helpful. But that doesn't mean that I completely clarified the whole thing in my mind. I still say there's this yeah. confusion of different subgroups yeah. that we could haggle over. But, but what you said was very plausible. Yeah. So anyway, so the PSL is sort of the smallest but like PSL2C is like the smallest Lorentz group. It's the, what the connected component. And then you could sp stick in spatial reflections if you wanted, and you'd get something twice as big. And that yeah, would be sort of- did you, did you just say something about reversing future and past or something like that? I mean, well, you could also do that. You could also do that. But apparently, apparently the Coxeter groups here are not doing both of those kind of reflections. It's just sort of doing the spatial reflection. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense, I think. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, what is what is what did the Voronoi cells look like for the Kleinian integers? So the Kleinian integers look like a bunch of rectangles that are, are they, are they rectangles that are tall and skinny like this? That's a great question. Uh, maybe, I, I think you may, so I think you, I think you make rhombuses by putting a, uh -huh. being right in the middle of each of those okay. rectangles. That's what I meant by the average of something. Right, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. The average between one and this square root of, yeah. So that would be right in the middle, middle of it. And that would create rhombuses instead of uh, yeah, rectangles. Okay. And then maybe you would split those. Well, okay, those, yeah, I think that. It's some. I think those rhombuses would uh -huh. be the, well, no, we would need the Poincare dual. Uh, yeah, we would need the Poincaré dual of those rhombuses. So what would those? What the Poincaré dual of the? Wait, you say the rhombuses are the Kleinians? The, the Kleinians live on the corners of rhombuses. I need to look up, remember what they. Something like that. I mean, half of the Kleinians live at the corners of those rectangles that you were talking about, and then the other half live in the centers of those rectangles. Um, oh. And so a fundamental region, I think, is like rhombus shaped.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So you know what I mean. I think you would. I think you would get a Voron Voron I cell by. Well, I said this right. Now I can't remember what a Voron I cell is because is it maybe really true that uh that doesn't sound right. I mean, is it true that the Voron, depending on what a Voron Voron I cell is, is it true that the Voron I cells for the Eisenstein integers really do look like hexagons that, you know, if you just put a... Yeah, if you put things in a triangular lattice, like the Heisen, Eisensteins, and then if you look at all the points nearest to one of those lattice points, you'll get a little hexagon. All right, I'm going to make a real quick attempt to draw a Voronoi cell for a Kleinian integer. So. What's the square root of seven, roughly? It's less than two? No, the cube root is a little bit. The square root is a little bit less than three? It's like. Yeah. <laughs> 2. 8? I don't know. I, I don't know. Here, I'll type in the square. I've never thought about the square root of seven very much. So it's 2.6. 2.6. 2. 6. 2. 6. Point six. Okay, so I've got the little rectangle. Got the little client. So after that is one point three. One point three. Okay, so that's in the middle there. And okay, and then those others are there. And now I'm trying to figure out what the Voronoi cells look like. And maybe they are hexagon shaped. Is that what they're? Like? I was thinking they're like some. <laughs> I guess they're I guess they're like you know skinny hexagons or something like that. Um, you should be able to share your screen. No, you could just don't have to share your screen. What am I talking about? You just uh, like I could just hold share your up. notebook. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Let me try and do that. I mean, it's not a good picture, but uh, yeah, huh, huh. Okay, huh. Like, those skinny hexagons are my attempted pictures of the Voronoi cells of a, of a Kleinian integer. Okay, that's interesting. So I'm imagining. One um, thing I realized I never thought about is like, you've got like, well, you've got like all these lattices in the plane. And so sometimes the Voronoi duals are going to be hexagons, apparently. And then sometimes, at least sometimes, they're going to be like squares, like. The dual, and so yeah. I, 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 now I want to know how it like morphs over from being a a square to a to a hexagon. I have to. There's, there's interesting stuff to say about that, but I don't think it helps to say about it at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm not, not even sure I did it right, but my I, the reason I was ex you know I may have drawn what I was expecting, and I think I changed my mind about what I was expecting. I, I think I was at first expecting rhombuses, and then. Change my mind to hexagons or something like that. But um, okay. Anyway, it would be <laughs> yeah. Yeah, be fun to see. Is that really? Ah. Uh... Okay, <laughs> I didn't draw that correctly. I didn't draw that correctly. Let me try again. Ah. I think it's gonna be hexagons the other way. It's gonna be something like. Yeah, okay, I screwed that up. Let me try Let me try a different one. I think it still looks like a hexagon, but it's hexagon in a different way. <laughs> it's getting really screwed up. Yeah, okay. Okay, well. Now I don't trust you anymore. So anyway, I will try to draw it sometime. But yeah. So some sort of stubby hexagons is the vague guess. So okay. So like, right? The actual elements of the group should correspond to some of some sort of flags in this tile. So like. Right in the very center of the picture, there, there was this one particular grid, 
and that worked either for the Gaussian ones or for the Eisenstein ones, and in my guess, also according for the Kleinian ones or any of the other ones. So you've got this grid of something, grid of hexagons, grid of squares, grid of stubby hexagon in the meta middle. And that's like supposed to be the boundary of one of these non-compact regions, one of these bubbles with an infinite number of sides. And my vague idea is that that corresponds to like a, a subgroup of this SL2 thing or GL2 thing or something, a subgroup that's got ones on the main diagonal, zeros in one corner, and it leaves in the other corner, corner room for just one, you know, Kleinian integer or whatever integer. And um, sorry, that's supposed to be what's fixing one of these square tilings. One of these non-compact regions. Yeah. Yeah. One of these tiles, not so much tilings. One of these. Oh yes. Okay. The thing you're calling a tiling. I'm calling that a tile because you know it's a two-dimensional tiling, but that two-dimensional tiling you're talking about is a is the boundary of this three-dimensional tile. Yeah. Uh, this non-compact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, and those those are sort of the bubbles, right? The bubbles in that, you know, I'm analogizing it now to the SL2Z kind of thing, where we have mm -hmm. these two-dimensional bubbles with boundaries that just correspond to the integers. Plain old integers, you know, in two dimensions. Uh huh. Uh huh. So you, you know, you can you can picture that SL two Z picture fitting into any one of these other ones, the Gaussian or the Eisenstein or the Kleinian. Mm hmm. So um. Yeah, I happen to have this other one because I've been thinking about this stuff. So you mean this one here, this kind of thing? Yeah. This, yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. So that's, you know, I, I, we are trying to analogize this picture you're showing now. Right. To the picture, to these three-dimensional pictures. And we're claiming that, I think, I think I'm claiming that all of those three-dimensional pictures have this as a very sensible two-dimensional cross-section, you know, the completely real section, something like that. Mm -hmm. So what am I trying to say here? Well, so each bubble would be a different conjugate of that subgroup. Vaguely. Of which subgroup? That, there's probably a one name you, for it. It's, the one you mentioned, uh-huh. Yeah, one's on the main uh -huh. diagonal. I, I want to say something like unipotent or something. Maybe that is what it's called, unipotent? It's not quite Borel. It's, you know, subgroup of the Borel. Uh, it, it, maybe it's abelian. Maybe it, maybe it really is. It's just. Uh huh. Am I claiming that those triangular matrices with ones on the diagonals, those, the way that those matrices multiply, is that they really just add? Okay, so that's just like addition in the relevant kind of integers. Yeah. So it's just like addition in one of those tilings. That's what I'm claiming. That's what I'm, that's what uh -huh. I'm claiming. That we, so what I'm claiming is that in a distorted curvilinear way, we're seeing very flat affine tilings showing up mm -hmm. in these pictures. And so, okay, what time is that? I'm, I can't see the clock. It's 325-ish. Okay. So I have five minutes left and I'm trying to... Uh, Trying to wrap it up now. So I, I'm just trying to wrap it up with a silly idea here. So, well, it's not even that silly. I mean, there's some interesting patterns that I'd like to try to figure out here. So I keep on harping on the Kleinian integers because I think that they really fit into the pattern here, but in a way that goes beyond the Coxeter regime. But now I really, really want to unharp on the Kleinian integers. I want to go back to the ones that really are Coxeter tiles. Uh -huh. The Gaussian one, the Eisenstein one, and the plain old integers. And there may be some other examples that fit in here, but I don't know what they are. Like, are there like, you know, four dimensional numberings that fit in here? I don't know. But I'm talking about ones that we can get Coxeter tilings from. So in other words, let's just stare at the Coxeter diagrams for these three examples that we're looking at. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, we've already, we've already commented on some of the naive patterns here, but, not, but let's really, you know, think about it some more. So uh, let's see. So you, it, right, I think it always starts with the big number. So like six, three, three, it always, right. It always starts with a <laughs> relatively big number and then it ends with a three. So for the Eisenstein integers, it's six, three, three. Mm -hmm. For the Gaussian integers, it starts with the relatively big number. It's hard to tell which one you're starting with because the two fours look very identical, but it's, it goes four, four, three for the Gaussian integers. For the ordinary integers, it just goes, you know, there's, there's just two numbers, the, right? The diagram is short. There's just three dots in the straight line Coxeter diagrams and two edges between them. And it goes infinity three, you know, so it's infinity comma three. Uh -huh. So it's six, three, three, four, four, three, and infinity comma three. So in each case, if you, Right, I'm, 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 you know, we, we decided to put the three at the end because if you, if you leave off the three, then you're getting the Coxeter diagram for a sort of very affine, you know, you're getting a flat tiling, right? I mean, that thing with just infinity, right? If, if you do, if, if you look at the ordinary interest one, if you chop off the three at the end, you've just got two dots with infinity between them. And that's a very flat time. That's just the dihedral, infinite dihedral group. So that's sort of the integers. I mean, I guess, you know, it's got two different colors. So it's got like vertexes at the integers and edge barrier centers at the half integers or something like that. You know, there are intervals between the integers. But do you see what I'm saying? That So that when you top off the three from the integers, you are left with this Coxeter diagram Right, so we're saying there's like a Coxeter diagram for the integers itself and a Coxeter diagram for SL2 or something like SL2 over the integers. And the mm -hmm. only difference between them is that there's an extra vanilla edge stuck on to the, the one for the integers. Uh -huh. that's not, that, so that's the naive pattern we have. The naive uh -huh. pattern is that whenever you want to get this SL2 or GL2 thing or something like that, you know, this is a very shaky pattern, but <laughs> but there's something there, right? Uh -huh. It says somehow you're supposed to know which dot you're supposed to act, attach the extra vanilla edge to. And then you just attach an extra vanilla edge to it. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, vanilla just means that the label on it is three. The, the so, do you see what I'm saying? My question is, what's going on here? What is this pattern? How can you extend this pattern further? Should you extend this pattern further? <laughs> can you in, somehow incorporate, you know, should, I mean, probably we should incorporate, in, you know, the slightly irregular examples like decline in integers. We should incorporate those into this pattern somehow, but that re requires extending beyond the concept of Coxeter tiling. We need slightly more general kinds of tiling with slightly more irregular tile. Um, but right, there's some pattern going on here. It says something uh -huh. like- Yeah, it is nice. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, the and, easiest way you- Yeah. The easiest way for me to try to extend it Although yeah. I can't do it in, at the spur of the moment, is that is actually to go. I'll admit, it's sort of weird. It's to go to these quaternionic number fields that you are number fields that you are hinting at, because these guys. Uh, do you think that works for all of these? At least for the two. So these guys that I was, where I learned about these hyperbolic honeycombs. Yeah. They also think about hyperbolic higher dimensional honeycombs. Yes. And and like how I think they have one they have they talk about ones coming from like connected to the quaternions too. So so there could be something like that that happens. Yeah, there's all sorts of potential things, but I don't know what's going on, but there's something going on here, right? I mean, that's, you know- You're making me want to think, yeah. You're making me want to look at 533, three, <laughs> um, which is not a crystallographic Coxeter group. So it's gotta be bad in some way. 
But well, but I mean, but the pattern says to start out with something that's flat. So five three. That's not flat, right? That's not flat. I mean, are there right, other right. flat things we could stick in there? Not in two dimensions. Okay, okay, but maybe there are flat things in other. So like. Yeah. So I was thinking about like yeah. So like there would be like. So these two dimensional flat things are like the Gaussians and the Eisensteinians. Uh, but then there would be like four dimensional, like for example, like the Lipschitz, like the Hurwitz integers, or like you can think of them as like a four dimensional flat uh, honeycomb. And then there's, so they will give you a discrete subgroup of PSL2 quaternions. So PSL2 quaternions actually does make sense. And it's the Lorentz group in uh, six dimensions. So there would be like some discrete subgroups of the Lorentz group in six dimensions that would be connected to. All right, I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting that, but, but yes, I should really <laughs> think about that. I should really think about that. But, but let me make one more silly comment before we quit. I think we're just about out of time, but let me, let me make one more silly comment before we quit. That is that, um, what am I trying to say? I mean, I keep on calling this a pattern, but right, you, it's such a yeah, yeah. Well, I know. You know, it's like one of those things one of those Russian guys would invent and call it a pattern. Um, Rosenfeld. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's his name. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, but but maybe this is a pattern, and in particular, you know, if you incorporated the Kleinians and all, you know, maybe that really would work. But if it is a pattern, it apparently involves something like knowing where you're supposed to stick the extra edge, right? There should be some particular dot. How do you identify the correct dot? Like with the Gaussian one, you don't have to worry because it just looks like four, four. So, you know, you just stick it on <laughs> any end and it works. But with the Eisenstein, and how do you know to attach the three to the three instead of to the six? I don't know. But a vaguely suggestive idea that doesn't quite work is that these affine things really remind, right? I mean, there really are these things called affine Dinkin diagrams that really do give you these flat tilings. And it's, it's, it, this doesn't quite work, but if you have one of the, these, these traditional affine tilings, they re result from adding an extra dot to the unaffine Dinkin diagram. So the traditional affine the traditional affine Dinkin diagrams really do have a special dot. And maybe that's the oh. dot where you're supposed to. I didn't check this, but may, may, maybe that's the dot. I don't know if it makes any sense. Maybe that's the dot where you're supposed to attach the extra edge. I mean, it's like we're, it's like we're, it's like we're actually, you know, it's like we're at, attaching two extra dots instead of just one extra dot. You know, and the, the first extra dot is just the place where you're supposed to attach the second extra dot. <laughs> None of this makes sense. None of this actually works as far as I checked, but it's very suggestive. And, uh -huh. um, uh, but you know, under the Mackay correspondence, that extra dot in the X, you know, the extra dot in the Dinkin diagram for the simply laced things, mm -hmm. that is like, what is it? Is it the identity representation, I think, or something? It's, it's the unit representation. I mean, the thing, yep. that gets, the thing that gets attached to is the tautological representation of SU2 or something like that. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so, so yeah, so, so now I really don't have anything intelligent to say in, in addition to anything that I've already said. Um, but but I, hope you, I, hope you're getting, I hope you're getting a sense of what these silly guesses are about how to maybe invent a pattern about these, yes. uh -huh. this relationship between very flat tilings that correspond to the algebraic integers themselves and then these extra funny hyperbolic tilings that correspond to something like SL2 or GL2 over the number ring. There's, uh -huh. there's, yep. there's, there's, there's games to play. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that sounds fun. Sounds, okay. sounds good. <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, yeah. This, yeah, this so was, anyway, this... I'm still hoping yeah. that these... Yeah, so I'm still hoping that some of these are connected to Neuron Severi groups. And yes. so far, the only one that I know 
or I, I don't know, but I feel like it's got to be is this like Gaussian one. I'm pretty oh. sure that the I, that the Eisensteinian and the Kleinian and so forth that all of those work. I'm pretty sure that all of those work. Um, but I'm worried about this business about well maybe it will work. But I'm so I'm worried about this business of like oh I just got some extra clue. So someone else, some other guy on meth overflow <laughs> says that actually the neuron severity group is four dimensional only when Oh, you'll love this. Only yeah. when you have an abelian surface. First, the old stuff is that it's a product of. It's uh, sorry. It's a. Uh, it's a product. I won't do this isogenous junk, but basically, it's a product of two elliptic, of an elliptic curve in itself. But then, second of all, that curve has to have complex multiplication. They say. Yeah, those are the ones that we're talking about. So the <laughs> integers, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, those are the ones, right. So so I can sort of see how the, um, how there's like this completely sort of hyper cubicle abelian variety that's just gonna like come from taking the quaternions mod the, <laughs> sorry, like taking the complex numbers squared modulo the Gaussian, integers squared. Yes. But then there's this tetrahedral torus that I love, which is coming from taking the quaternions mod the Hurwitz integers. So this is the D4 one. I meant to bring that up. I meant to bring up the D4 thing. Okay. So um, that so now yeah so you're making me think that's like yeah so that's a, apparently different from what we've been talking about right now, which is taking the uh right complex numbers squared mod the Eisenstein's squared. Right, and this guy and maybe some other people are saying that it's not gonna give us a you know complete co-compact Lorenzian tiling, but it's still gonna you know, live in that, that one dimensional neuron severity, probably one dimensional, it's probably gonna live in that, in that Minkowski space time. I mean, I mean that should yeah. That's I would I just wanted to suggest a vague idea that the D four case, which I think is another name for the case you're talking about, mm -hmm. that that's a good test case for seeing what happens when you don't have a square uh -huh. elliptic curve. I think uh -huh. I think that's not a square elliptic curve, and so it's a good test case. You know, it's still very nice. It's still very ungeneric, yeah. but it's uh -huh. if I understand correctly, it's not at all a square elliptic curve. So it could be. Mm -hmm. So I guess you heard my my I, the thing I said in email. My dr dream is that like in one of the honeycombs that we were looking at, yes, the vertices or some the midpoints of some feature will be the principal polarizations. Yes. Yeah. So that that's what I I just want to I want to find a situation where there. Where it yes, works like that. And I absolutely think something like that is going to work. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much claiming without you know checking it carefully, but I'm, but I really think it's true. It's going to work for any one of these complex multiplication ones. Uh -huh. um, just with you know slightly slightly irregular tilings outside of the Gaussian and Eisenstein cases. And um, yeah, so you know I. I I'm still really interested in the one, you know, like, yeah, like I'm really interested in, you know, taking this first principle concrete definition of the neuron severity forms, the neuron severity elements by this very concrete thing. Mm -hmm. I, I really want to apply that to the D4 thing and see if we can very explicitly see what the elements of the neuron severity group are as explicit carry digit two co-cycles for, for right. D4. And there's just uh -huh. Z's worth of them, apparently. That's what people seem to be telling us. But yeah, anyway, I, was, I want to see what they uh -huh. are. Yeah, I, I was just last night starting to imagine trying to understand the alternating integer valued forms on, on the Hurwitz integers and then try to <laughs> just dreaming of imagining like what, which ones obey this condition of getting along with multiplication by I. 
Yeah, it should be exactly. it should be a you know, doable. Yeah, I didn't get thing. very far. I didn't get anywhere with it yet, but I thought about doing. It. Yeah, no, I didn't really get anywhere except I realized, hey, this is like something that I could yes. do. Yes, yes, yeah, I really want to do that. Uh -huh. um, anything else we could do before we quit now? No, that's that's plenty. Okay, okay, this was great. Um, it was great. Yep. Uh, all right. Okay, all right. so I'll try to see you again this time next week, unless you. I, I think that's. Otherwise. I think I think that's right. And it really did seem like this seemed like a vast improvement in terms. Yeah, of yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I feel better about my wireless, <laughs> but it's worse about yours. Yeah. So, and also we've got this thing recorded. I'll send you a link to this recording just for the hell of it. Sure, sure. Um, oh yeah, so another like a stupid question is like, were you saying like you wouldn't mind these things being put, being put on YouTube? Or are you like- That's true, you... that's true, I wouldn't mind. I don't okay, mind. yeah, I think I might do it. I think I might do it because- Okay. Because uh, I think it'd be sort of fun for people to be able to, <laughs> who knows who would bother to watch this stuff, but it'd be sort sure. of fun. Sure. I don't think it will damage our reputations any worse than they no, are. I don't think well. Any um, uh, you know, it, they, I think they might get better than this. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. Yep. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye. Yep. See you. Okay. Bye.